Okay, shall we start? It's a pleasure to be here and share with you some of my thoughts on how we got into this whole mess and uh, where we're headed and maybe a few comments about what you can do to protect yourself, what might be a logical approach here. I want to begin by reading two comments from 18 months ago, roughly. The first one is from Tre uh, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, April 20th, 2007. If it wasn't for all the mess we're in now, you would have never known who the Treasury Secretary is, right? Here's what he said last April. I don't see the subprime mortgage market troubles imposing a serious problem. I think it's going to be largely contained. Then, five weeks later, from Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke on May 17th, we believe the effect of the troubles in the subprime sector on a broader housing market will likely be limited. And we do not expect significant spillovers from the subprime market to the rest of the economy or the financial system. Well, they didn't get that right, did they? Nobody did. I guess you can say we didn't see it coming. These are the two most powerful, knowledgeable people in the economy. They see all the stats long before we do. Anyway, um, eight days ago, the U.S. House of Representatives turned down the proposed bailout bill, defeated it by 12 votes, something like that. And that was the day the stock market went down 777 points. To most people in economics, to most people with a knowledge of finance, we were exceptionally upset about that. That just was the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's sort of like your house is on fire, and instead of running out and calling the fire department, we get into an argument about why the house is on fire. And time's a wasting. The quicker the fire department comes, the less severe the damage will, will be, and certainly the house did some major damage to the U.S. economy and to the world economy by letting a fire spread. So it's part of the problem. I'm glad the bailout or the rescue plan has now gone forward. It would take a while for that to have an impact on the economy. The House seemed to be obsessed with who is to blame. That's not very useful. We could always come back and throw people in jail a year from now if we want for who's to blame. We should have got the job done. But what I want to do is talk about who is to blame. If we want to blame somebody and punish somebody, here's my list. First, we start with the Federal Reserve System. For years earlier this decade, the Federal Reserve kept interest rates at very, very low levels. You might recall the rate at which banks lend to each other was kept at 1% for quite a while. 1%, 1% interest. Inflation was 3%. When we keep interest rates lower than the rate of inflation, something bad is going to happen. And the Fed did this, it pumped money into the economy left and right. That's how interest rates go down. And this happened worldwide. This happened in Europe too. So what the Fed did, pumping that money in, led to a bubble in the housing industry. Not only that, it led to a, housing, a bubble in credit. All of you people, and by you I mean everybody in the US that did home equity loans to buy boats, to go on vacation, to whatever. That was made possible by low interest rates and free credit out there. You want it? Here you go. That's the low interest rate that a reserve created bubble. And all bubbles come to an end. And we now know that the housing bubble burst in July last year, July 207. And we're now feeling the effects everywhere, globally. Okay, so the Fed is to blame. Borrowers, I think borrowers are really to blame here. And I've thought about this, is that just my philosophy? Is that my frame of mind? That I'm not a borrower, and I'm not a person who should have never owned a home because I couldn't afford it? I'm sure they think differently. All the loans to people who couldn't afford to pay them back, all these people are to blame. I use the example, 
If I said to you, I will flat out give you $2 million, but you have to obey by my rules. And here are the rules. You have to spend it all this year on a $2 million house and live there at least 10 years. Would you do it? Would you do it? Most people thinking about it would say, no, I wouldn't. And the reason is just the property taxes. I'm guessing it would vary between 25 and 50,000 a year. Where is that money going to come from? The utilities to heat the house in the winter and cool it in the summer. Thousands, probably 10 to $20,000. And the routine maintenance. Things break on a $2 million house. There are a lot of things to break. And when they get repaired, it won't be cheap. The homeowner's insurance, probably 10 grand. Anyway, $75,000 annually at least, I think is what it would take to maintain a $2 million house. That's ignoring the monthly payment because I'm going to give it to you. So just because somebody says, here's the money, go buy yourself a house, doesn't mean that's a prudent thing to do. All the people who borrowed money with no income, no job, or incomes and jobs, but not enough money to pay back the loan and to keep the house going, that's just ludicrous. Why did they do that? Because they got to live someplace they never would have lived, at least for a couple, three years, until the house was foreclosed. One quarter of all mortgages in 2007 were adjustable rate mortgages. One quarter, 25%. This is a, in a year when fixed 30-year loans are near historical lows. This is ludicrous. We in the finance department would say to each other, who's doing this? Who would be that silly to borrow at 2.5% or 2.9% or 1% or 4 whatever it was, when interest rates might double or triple on mortgages, as pretty much they're going to. And they did. As soon as the easy money was over, the adjustable mortgages readjusted. Some people saw their mortgage rates, their payments triple. Some people saw them double. Couldn't pay off the loans. That was the end of them. The Community Reinvestment Act. This was started in 1977. It was pushed by President Carter. Seemed like a good idea. The intent was to prevent banks from what we, I don't think we call it that anymore, but from redlining. That is picking poor neighborhoods in big cities and saying we're not going to lend money in these areas. Well, the Community Reinvestment Act kind of forced lenders to do that. The act was strengthened under President Clinton during his administration. Banks had to make mortgages to people who the banks knew were not going to repay those mortgages. They were called Alt-A mortgages, subprime mortgages. We went from all mortgages in the U.S., 2% of them were subprime, to last year, 30% were subprime. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Not everyone in the U.S. should have a house. They can't. If we could click our fingers, that might be a nice thing to do. But not everyone is capable of owning a house. They don't have enough income. No way, no how. And yet we kind of force that. I was talking with a banker this morning and the banker said you would not believe the pressure that was on us by the banks and by the government to make mortgages. We had to meet our monthly goals. The guy I was talking with said I as a mortgage loan officer had to meet my monthly goal. The bank had to meet its monthly goal. The branch. The corporate headquarters had a goal. And there's no way to do that without lending to lower and lower credit risks. So the pressure was there to just make the mortgage. The reason the banks kept doing that was they sold the mortgages. Very few banks, certainly around here in the uh, Great Lakes states, very few banks actually keep their mortgages. They sell them off. They sell them to whom? They sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which buys standard mortgages, then Fannie and Freddie package thousands of them together, most good, some terrible, and then issue bonds with the mortgages as collateral. 
when the mortgages go under, if enough of them go under, the bond goes under. 